My name is Gloria and it is great to be with you. The Leaders of Africa Hangout is a live but weekly show on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. UTC. Hangouts are informative, interactive and informal. We invite you to discuss and interact with us. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube and the bell to receive notifications for all Leaders of Africa's new content. For those of you who are new to Leaders of Africa, Leaders of Africa mobilizes the power of research and creative expression to advance equity, justice, selfless leadership with a distinctly pan-African, community-oriented and interactive approach. Today, we are joined by three presenters to speak on the theme navigating the digital divide in meeting educational needs. Our first presenter today is Dr. Apasana Singh. She is a senior lecturer and academic leader of the discipline of information systems and technology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Her research interests include educational technology and its ability to mobilize student learning. And we also have Mr. Matthias Kronke. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Social of Political Studies at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. He is a graduate researcher at Afrobarometer, a nonpartisan pan-African research institution conducting public attitude surveys on democracy, governance, the economy, and society in three plus countries. His research focuses primarily on political parties and basic service delivery in Africa. And we also have as our third presenter today, Mrs. Shingarai Moyu. She is an international educationist and marketing specialist with more than a decade of successful experience in higher education, management, and administration. She's currently employed as a director of marketing, information and public relations with Manikalen State University of Applied Sciences in Zimbabwe. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Apasana Singh, Mr. Matthias Kronke, and Mrs. Shingarai Moyo to present and hang out with, with us today. We will start with Dr. Singh. Thank you, Gloria, for that introduction. Um, greetings to you, Matthias. Nice to see you again. Um, to all the fellow speakers and the audience. Today, I'm going to be speaking very briefly on some research which we conducted here in South Africa about the digital divide. So um, before we get into the actual results of the research and discussing that with you, just to give you a background in terms of what do we mean by the digital divide? Well, essentially, the digital divide refers to the gap between those who have access to technology, those who have access to data, to connectivity, and those who don't. And as we know, in many African countries, just like in South Africa, there is certainly a digital divide. And the COVID pandemic has uh, revealed this to be greater than we expected it to be. So moving on to the research which we conducted, I, I just want to share with you a bit of background into the research. When the pandemic um, first started and lockdown was, uh, you know, uh, initiated here in South Africa, as we explained at the previous session, many higher education institutions had to shut their doors because they weren't actually ready for the online environment. So at this point in time, uh, we decided that we wanted to just investigate how academics were responding to this entire move of uh, moving from face to face to the online space. So a question was developed and we managed to target seven, seven African countries, approximately 9,000 academics. 21 of those institutions were uh, contacted, seven private and 14 public higher education institutions. The seven African, African countries um, which participated or we had representation from included Ghana, Liberia, Mauritius, Namibia, South Africa, and Zambia. Because we wanted to ensure that we had a sufficient range of both public and private um, higher education institutions, we, we were selective in the final sampling so that we could get an even spread between the two different types of higher education institutions. <clears throat> 
As you may be well aware, in South Africa, we have very strict ethical clearance procedures. And I often joked to my collaborators that this was like doing another PhD, just trying to get ethical clearance and gatekeeper's consent from each of those 21 higher education institutions. At some institutions, you have to do the entire ethical clearance process or apply for ethical clearance in the same way that you do at your own host institution. Nevertheless, um, after about three or four weeks of perseverance, we got 21 permission letters and we decided to move ahead with data collection. To make the data collection easier, it was a quantitative questionnaire, but we did have a few open-ended questions so that we could get a little bit of feel into academics, actual feelings in terms of this move to the online environment. So finally, after the write-up was completed, we did have the chapter accepted and we're hoping that the publication comes out soon enough, so look out for it. Um, it is titled Challenges and Opportunities for the Global Implementation of E-Learning Frameworks. That's the name of the book, and it has been published by IGL. So here's a very brief rundown of the demographics. As you can see, um, the, the largest number of participants range between the ages of 13 and 60. We had a larger number of females than males, and so on. Uh, what was interesting to note here was that we had a fairly even split between junior level staff, that's including tutors and lecturers, and then the senior staff, that's including senior lecturers, associate professors, and co professors. So uh, the first thing we wanted to understand was what was education like in Africa prior to the pandemic? And as was expected, we found that majority of the institutions prior to COVID were co contact-based institutions, which means that they were offering face-to-face -face classes. And the shift was clear during the pandemic that they had to move to online. Most of them said it was that because they had no choice. We also found um, a rather interesting result was that prior to COVID, 30%, approximately 30% of institutions had some form of blended learning. But this reduced during the COVID pandemic because everybody was now moving towards the online environment. Okay. And then the next thing we looked at was in terms of academics, what was the greatest type of support they found reaching their students? So, um, were they able to reach students using emails? Were they able to reach students using the learning management system that was implemented? And we found that emails were still the most popular way in which academics during the start of the pandemic were able to communicate with the students. So this was direct emails with them. Next was online lectures. And this was probably because uh, students who attended the online lectures were able to uh, participate and to get the support that they required with their lectures itself. Form was not as popular, um, but nevertheless, it was also used. Now, the, the reason I want to just show you this result, although not all of it is related to the digital divide, is that not only were students facing problems in terms of access, in terms of technology, but even the academics themselves noted that, for example, um, they didn't have access to the technology or the tools that were required for effective teaching. So while they might have had access to technology, the, the actual technology that they needed to use in the classroom was not freely available at the start of the lockdown. Academics also faced internet connectivity issues, and I myself, as an academic, have faced many experiences in the past year where um, Zoom, for example, wouldn't work when it needed to, or my laptop would just restart in the middle of a session. So as you might see, I'm paranoid now about technology failing me, and I'm connected from my laptop and my mobile phone. Just in case I lose connectivity on my laptop, I can continue with the presentation from my mobile phone because it doesn't seem very professional if you just disappear. And then uh, a factor which we found very interesting was many academics were concerned with trying to connect with their students um, in terms of students not having good internet connection. 
So it was something which academics felt students did not have access to good internet connectivity. Therefore, they were not able to implement the online uh, teaching as effectively as possible. So those are the three factors that to me relate directly to um, the digital divide. Now moving on to the student side, which I think is probably um, the one that you are, you are most going to connect to. We looked at the students in Africa and what was their major concerns in terms of connect, connectivity and participation in the online classroom. And you can see here very clearly access to connectivity coming out at 88.5% and access to devices standing out at 71.9%. Not forgetting the other factors, okay, for example, lack of interaction. Students really didn't enjoy the online environment because either the lectures were not engaging enough or they were not able to connect with their colleagues. Um, some students noted technology competence, which again relates to digital divide, not being able to understand how to use the technology. Um, many of us academics say that our students today are techno savvy, our students today are far ahead of us in terms of technology and how to use it. But I'm sure that most of you would agree that many students or most students know to how to use their mobile phones to take out selfies, to connect with each other on Facebook, on Twitter. They know how to use these technological devices for socialization purposes. But how many of our students are competent enough? to be able to use these devices for online learning. And we find any number of excuses coming up with students who say that they are techno savvy, but not able to complete, for example, a submission of an assignment online, not able to complete an assessment online, not able to connect for an online lecture. So there is that component of having to teach our students how to use the technology for education purposes. Now, this slide is a little bit um, heavy, but all that we tried to look at here was what type of access do the students have? Now, despite many students saying that internet connectivity is an issue for them, it was uh, found here that students seem to have access to, uh, to Wi-Fi and to mobile data, but the majority of the students were accessing most of their courses online using the free data which was provided by the institution. Okay, so the government initiatives are providing free data to students who continue their online learning was clearly adopted the most. Okay, um, then we also looked at in terms of what type of data packages did they use and this varied. A small number of students said that they had more than 10 gigabytes of data and uncapped data, but as you can see, majority of the students seem to have less than 10 gigabytes of data. Now, is that enough if they need to connect to online lectures for, say, four modules a semester or five modules a semester, and each of those having sessions of between one and a half to two hours a week? Okay. So, um, we as lecturers also need to learn how to balance those delivery mechanisms so that students don't run out of data and not able to continue with their learning. We also looked at the quality, reliability, the type of signal, and the speed of the internet connection. Okay, as you can see, quality was good at times with the majority of the students, reliability as well. So it wasn't a clear um, distinction saying that they had good reliability with quality, that their speed was good at all, at all times. The so students were having to figure out which part of the day, which times is going to be most suitable for them to access online resources. And then we also looked at general literacy skills versus platform literacy skills, because as part of the digital divide, some, some aspects that we need to look at are not only the digital capital that students possess, but also their literacy levels, the social capital, the economic capital, all of that contributes towards understanding the digital divide. So under general lit, um, literacy, we looked at their the competency in using the learning management system, their competency in using digital tools in general, and the competency in networks 
So for example, if a network had to drop, do they know how to reconnect? If they're having a, you know, slow connectivity, do they know how to resolve that issue? Um, those kind of aspects with regard to network literacy. I mean, in terms of platforms, we looked at the four most common platforms here, and it seemed that on average, all of these were about three for um, LMS, digital, and network literacy. Zoom, because it was the most popular tool uh, which was used for online learning, seemed to have a, a larger medium. And then we have the other types of literacy. These seem to have been less used uh, tools, and so maybe that's why there, there were less responses to it. So just to round up, because I know that um, we are in need to finish up, we also had some questions which looked at the transition for learners to move to the online environment. And uh, we had a set of factors and we asked the students to rate themselves uh, against each of those factors. And after doing a factor analysis, we came up with or what emerged from the data was two very distinct categories. One was a, a social category well, which looked at personal uh, skills and the other looked at engagement skills. So you can see for the first half here, which was factor one, students uh, felt that the shift of the transition to the online environment forced them to become independent learners, to facilitate holistic learning and to encourage a growth mindset. They had to self-regulate in terms of ensuring that they kept up to date with their syllabus, completed their assessments on time. It also helped to foster critical thinking skills and they had to be flexible to changing circumstances. And I think COVID has taught us that, that uh, very clearly that we have to be flexible because nothing is going to be constant um, in the future. We never know when we're going to have a sudden lockdown. We never know when we're going to have access, when we're not going to have access, and so on. Okay. Um, then if you look at the second set of, of skills here in terms of the factor analysis, this looked at or we categorize these into the engagement sort of factors. Here they said that um, online learning helped them to, to foster collaboration. It improved their communication skills because they now had the opportunity to communicate with their lecturers one-on-one. -on -one. They had the opportunity to connect and communicate with their fellow colleagues one-on-one. -on -one. And one that stands out for me in particular is the concept of empathy. Um, having empathy for their fellow learners in the class. Many of the students felt that in this online environment, they were exposed to many more difficulties which their colleagues and students were facing in their own classroom, which helped them to develop this emotional intelligence and empathy for their fellow learners. So just to summarize, in terms of the digital divide, in my opinion, the digital divide is real. As we can see here from some of the comments that came from the students, the first group of comments which I've highlighted here all relate to data access, um, not sufficient uh, data, not good enough gadgets, so they're wanting better technology, the, the data was too costly for them, and to ensure that there was equal distribution of both data and devices so that they could access online learning. Other interesting comments which stood out uh, looked at online plat platforms. They need to be tested properly. They need to be checked before they are implemented, as well as the fact that academics need to be trained on these platforms before they start delivering to students. Okay. Then the other factor that came out from the qualitative comments, which linked back to the quantitative data, was the fact that students required emotional support and they wanted interaction with their friends and with their fellow students. And finally, finding the right balance between a long lecture of 45 minutes and a short lecture of just one or two minutes. Okay, so I would like to end my presentation at this point, and I would uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity of sharing our results with you. As I explained, um, some of this data has been 
published in that chapter and other of the data is still going to be used for future um, research purposes. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh, for that very um, insightful study. Very interesting facts that you shared with us today. I'm curious, just a, one quick question uh, before we move over to the next presentation, but we will have more questions later. I guess the one question I have, I don't know if you've been able to get this information from your from your study, I'm curious to what happens to students who find themselves caught up in this, all the problems that you, you, you've explained. You mentioned that there's a majority of students who still have less than 10 gigabytes of data. What happens to them? Do they drop out or do they just fall behind? I'm just curious what's happening to those who are still struggling with the change. Okay, so those students who, um you know, didn't have access to sufficient amount of data. We, I can tell you what happened at UKZN, uh, for example. Well, we did. We tried to to locate students who were having problems in terms of in terms of access. And then, when uh, the lockdown had eased a little bit, and students were allowed to come back to campus, they were the first set of students who were allowed to come back, so that they could now access. Um, you know, institutional resources using the institutional networks. Uh, we also had many sessions of catch-up assessments. So, you know, we had the normal tests that you would have. And, and in, in last semester, all of the assessments were continuous assessments. So instead of having a typical two assessments per, sem per semester for that module, we would have sometimes four or five different assessments and then we would take the best of the two so that if students can access at a particular time, uh, we would, you know, they could take another assessment. We also found that we had to extend assessment periods or so assessment windows, let me put it that way. So if a quiz was meant to be taken for an hour and if the assessment was meant to be from nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, we no longer had fixed times from nine to 10, but it was open from nine to three and students were given a maximum of an hour in order to complete that assessment. So, you know, we, it, I think it was a learning process for all of us because as things went wrong, we realized how we needed to work to fix it. And then of course, the whole um, issue of if they had needed to renew data, students would often renew the data packages at their own cost if they were really interested in completing those assessments and if they had access to financial resources. So I don't think there's a clear cut answer. Uh, we do have many students who have fallen behind. And I think I explained in the previous session that we have students who are deeply demotivated and who have dropped out completely because they cannot cope with the online environment. And those are real challenges that we need to work with. Wow. Um, it sounds like um, there's been a lot of adjustment and just putting out there very intentional procedures and measures for different, to accommodate, you know, different uh, situations. But yeah, amazing work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I don't know if anyone else has a question for Dr. Sin right now before we move to the next presentation. If you do have a question, uh, you can raise your hand right here if you click on the chat. But if not, I will invite uh, Matthias to go ahead with his presentation today. This is actually following on quite nicely um, from what Dr. Singh has um, presented just now. Um, it's based on a policy paper that was published with Afrobarometer. Um, and we're looking at digital literacy at a continental scale. And just to uh, remind us all a, a little bit about how the uh, pandemic has unfolded. So here are three snapshots of the extent to which schools have been closed um, across uh, the past year. So uh, 11 months ago, we had pretty much everyone uh, closed down in, in Africa. Six months ago, this picture looked a lot different already, with several countries um, having recommended closures, but not completely. And as of yesterday, we have several countries, especially uh, Central and, and Eastern Africa, that have opened this completely. And the question is, of course, in those countries, why have they, why have they had to reopen? Uh, 
Is it because there's just less uh, incidences of COVID or is it because they don't have the uh, resources and the infrastructure to actually move to digital uh, and e-learning? Um, and we'll try start exploring this, um, this aspect, particularly by looking at what are the prerequisites um, and what is the extent of digital literacy across the continent? So the first thing that, that uh, we'll be looking at is the infrastructure. What is in place so that um, citizens can actually use the, uh, digital devices? Um, so here we're talking about electricity as well as just a cell network. Then, of course, you don't just need this that infrastructure, you also need the devices to use it. So how widely available are they um, across the continent? And here we're looking at cell phones, smartphones, and computers. And then lastly, how often do uh, citizens use these devices? And to an extent, how digitally literate are they? And this is very similar to, the, the concepts are very similar to what um, Dr. Singh uh, explained earlier. And although it is, um, the measurement is, is less precise, uh, just because this is based on Afrobarometer data, um, which which is not necessarily geared towards it, but um, it provides some really good insights, I think. So just to uh, preview some of the, the key findings, across 34 African countries, we find that on average, 62% of households have access to cell service and electricity in their neighborhood. So that's putting it positively. If we flip it, of course, it's 40% of, of Africans don't have access to these things in the neighborhood. So they almost a priori excluded uh, from this. Um, when it comes to the devices, we know that about 20% of adults have access to both a smartphone and a computer, um, while 43% only have access to a basic cell phone, not more than that. So again, when we talk about what type of digital literacy we're looking at, we need to bear in mind that a Zoom and a Microsoft Teams and a Skype is at the very top end of what is possible. But there are obviously a range of different things that we can use to communicate. Uh, last week, we heard about uh, doing um, lectures via WhatsApp. Uh, we already have various uh, digital payment structures and, and platforms in place that don't require smartphones. So to what extent can we then adapt this for the educational purposes, for example? And with regards to literacy, we find that 20% of adults are well prepared to participate uh, in or assist members of their household with the transition to an online learning environment, but 80% are not. And so this seems like a very low number, only one in five, and it is even worse in some countries. Um, but there are some countries across Africa where, we, where it is pretty high. And I think, if nothing else, it would be a good takeaway from this presentation to look at those countries and see what can we implement from those countries in the different contexts. I find that often a, a more fruitful approach than saying, well, let's look at, I don't know, Sweden, the US and Germany. What do they do and how can we learn from them? The contexts are often so different that those lessons they might not be that useful. And so I think looking at other African cases is often a more fruitful endeavor. Okay, quickly some information about the data. This is all based on Afrobarometer data. Um, it's a public opinion survey. You can see um, we've conducted surveys in all countries except those that are of the, the gray uh, dark shape. Um, so we have a pretty good coverage um, across the continent. Uh, this data is mostly was collected in 2016 and 2018. So it is all prior to the pandemic. But I think if we have a good sense of what the level of digital literacy has been prior, was prior to the outbreak of the pandemic, we can kind of gauge the trajectory for some of these countries. Um, and each of these surveys is nationally representative between 1,200 and 2,400 um, respondents per country. Okay, let's look at the first bit, the digital infrastructure. So here again, we're looking at availability of cell service and electricity in the neighborhood. Not necessarily hooked up to your own house, but you might be able to go to a coffee shop uh, or your neighbor. 
And we can see that over the past 15 years, this has increased drastically, especially the cell service availability, purely because it's much easier to put up a cell tower and reach coverage than it is to hook up individual households. And so we see that for the various uh, country samples, and over time, Afrobarometer has asked more and more countries. So you'll see that over time, this has increased by about 10%, but we're still at only 62% of people, of households, of, of neighborhoods who have that type of connectivity. Now, if we combine this and we say the basic necessities for the digital infrastructure is cell service and uh, availability of electricity, we see that um, at the top end, we've got Mauritius, which has almost universal access, uh, as well as Eswatini in Tunisia. But at the very low end, we've got Mali, Madagascar, Burkina Faso, all less than a third uh, of residents who have access to these things. So here, speaking about digital literacy, we're almost inevitably talking about a very slim section of society. Um, compared to some of the countries I mentioned earlier. The next bit is the digital devices. So uh, here it's uh, cell phones, smartphones, and computers. But when we look at that, uh, Afrobarometer asks, which of these things do you personally own? Or if you don't own them, do you have access to these things in the household? And here we see a similar set of countries at the top end and the bottom end. Mauritius, Morocco, Cabo Verde, all have fairly high uh, averages, uh, whereas Niger, Malawi, Madagascar are at the bottom. And here, I think what, what's really important is we, to, if we look at it, to, to separate. Of course, it's ideal to have a smartphone and a computer for everyone. But there's so many platforms, and even the UN has put up a huge list of just different platforms and, and service providers where you can use digital communication with tools that, that uh, might not have internet access, or you can do it only via a smartphone, you don't need a laptop necessarily. And so it's that space, I think, where we can see a lot of innovation, not only being transferred to Africa, but also coming from Africa. Um, that can really help improve educational technology across the continent. When we look at who actually has these devices, uh, I think it's not too much of a surprise that uh, young people are more likely to have access to, to these devices and the more educated ones, uh, um, as well as those who are less poor. So here it's a live poverty index, meaning if you don't have access to some of the basics like healthcare, education, cash, cooking fuel, and so on, uh, you perceived as having high live poverty and no live poverty means you, you have access to all of these things. Interestingly, um, the number of adults in a household doesn't make much of a difference. So you'd imagine if people start pooling their resources uh, we might have higher levels of access to it, but that's not necessarily the case. But we see um, quite expectedly, I would say, that those in upper and middle class households have much higher levels of access than those that don't. To, to show some of the changes and how rapidly these things are, are trans uh, the, this context is, is transforming itself, we can look at a selection of countries that were surveyed just prior to, co to the COVID outbreak. And we can see in just a matter of five years, uh, in Malawi, for example, we have from just under half of people who have access to a basic cell phone, it increased to two thirds. Uh, sim or even a similar strong, uh, strong increase uh, in Uganda as well. So these changes are happening at a massive scale and, and quite rapidly. Even when we look at the, the share of smartphones, it increased pretty much across the board, uh, with the exception of Malawi. Um, we see quick changes within a matter of two or three years. So for the, for the environment to, to keep abreast and for, this, for schools to be able to utilize these, these tools that are becoming available, we really, really need to um, work at a, at a very fast pace. As educators, 
uh, as universities, as uh, as administrators, or just as as education departments across the continent. The third bit is digital literacy. So this is how often do people use these devices and that we use as a proxy for, well, if you use these things frequently, we'd imagine that you are more comfortable with a device, you're more able to, to, to execute uh, more complex tasks. Although, as Dr. Singh reminded us earlier, it is of course possible that people use a device in some areas like uh, social media or communicating with family, but are less equipped to do an upload of an assignment. But we can assume if you, if you do the one more often, you're more likely to be able to transition these, these skills. So of those that use a mobile phone and the internet every day, or at least a few times a week, we can again see the massive differences um, Mali, Niger, Madagascar, next to no, or, yeah, very few people use these devices both very regularly. Um, whereas in Mauritius, Gabon, and Tunisia, this is fairly frequent. And, but only about eight or nine countries have, uh, have a population, have more than half the population use these tools frequently. If we think about the Higher education, of course, um, we know that that is already a, a wealthier section of society, so they're more likely to do these things. But as we talked about uh, last week, those that come out from, from uh, high school, it's very difficult um, to accommodate these very diverse backgrounds and make sure that we have an even or a, a good cross-section of society that is actually able to move to university if they don't have the necessary digital uh, literacy levels. Similar to the ownership index, when we look at who uses these uh, tools frequently, we see those with higher levels of education the, and younger people and wealthier people to use them more frequently. Now, when we want to think about e-learning readiness, we don't only need the tools, that was our second index, but we also need the familiarity with these devices. So when we combine how frequently you use them and the, the devices you have access to, we can, uh, we can put this together into a digital literacy index, or readiness index rather. And here the high means, uh, the dark green means you have you own a smartphone, you have access to a computer, you can use a, a phone and internet, uh, the internet fairly regularly. And that is only across the 34 countries that we have. There's only one country that comes close to half the population being able to do that. On the other end, we have Madagascar, Malawi, Niger, uh, Niger at the bottom, where less than 20% um, have this ability. So, there is a big bulk in the middle where we have the potential to use and to, to improve the, the situation if, for example, they have access to ownership of some of these devices. So in the policy paper, I go into some more detail about, well, what would it do if we use this capital-intensive route of um, providing devices? Would it help people? And at least in the preliminary analysis that I provide there, we see that Doing this upfront investment of providing these devices to, for example, students um, or parents would really, really increase the digital literacy readiness because they have this, this initial investment is, is not the, uh, no longer the problem. But it would also help us with some other issues, such as the gender gap, uh, so the, the literacy, digital literacy rates between men and women. And it would particularly help because we're talking about the adult population here. It would be really helpful as it has the knock-on effect of being able to provide this for the household. So while not ideal, it still helps us to reach several uh, children, for example, or young adults that might be sharing the, the, uh, the space in their household. So just to, to wrap up, when we talk about the digital divide, we need to think about it in three ways. 
the infrastructure in the neighborhood, the devices that people have access to, as well as the literacy or the familiarity with these devices. And here we can see huge differences across the continent. Um, however, for both groups, the general population as well as the caretakers, so those that are 18 and above, um, the level of digital literacy is shaped by the availability of the basic infrastructure and the educational attainment of those adults, rather than um, the wealth of the household or the geographic location, so whether it's urban or rural, or whether you're old or young. So I think that's another interesting thing is if you give middle-aged or older people, if you give them access to these devices and you give them a reason to, to try and learn them, it, it works pretty well and pretty quickly. And I think this is, this is another important takeaway message is that the, these learning processes can happen uh, at various stages um, pretty well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kronke, for that presentation. Very interesting. Uh, Peter actually pointed out in the chat that uh, the countries that have the most access to digital technology are highland countries, Mauritius, Cap Verde. These are highland countries, small countries. They don't even have a lot of people. There are very few uh, infrastructural constraints, but they're the ones that have you know, all the technology that these high-populated countries need. So, yeah. That's interesting. And I have another question for you. you. That is coming from Juliana. Uh, Juliana wrote in the chat uh, that what is a gender divide in ownership of digital devices? How big it is or, or what it is? Sorry, I didn't see the chat. Um, uh, I don't know if Juliana is available to want to ask your own question. Juliana, are you willing to unmute? And, yes, um, I just wanted to know what is the gender divide in ownership of the uh, digital devices in terms of numbers? Um, uh, obviously, uh, obviously, there will be a class dimension to that, as well as racial divide within that. So here we can see the difference. Um, this is uh, those that own a smartphone and a computer. It's uh, the difference is 17 and, and 21 percent, so four percent. Although this is still within the the margin of error, um, but overall we we see. Uh, I'd have to add this up. Um, 40 an eight percent difference um, between this is in terms of owning at least a smartphone or a computer. Um, we see an eight percent difference between men and women. When we look at the literacy rate, we see a nine. Well, we see a slightly different. Um, no, sorry, a similar uh, difference again between uh, men and women, with men having the higher levels of of literacy. Before we get more questions, I have one for you. Um... Mr. Kronke, it, it appears to me that there are more people who have access to mobile phone as opposed to a computer. And so I'm curious in terms of um, e-learning, how much are institutions and professors making use of mobile phones? Because platforms such as um, Google Teams and Zoom and all of that, I mean, all of this can work on a mobile phone, but when it comes to assessment and all of that, I don't think that they are you know, students are able to do the assessment on their mobile phone. So is, like, so what's the role of mobile phones in education? Can somebody who only has a mobile phone be able to fully participate in an um, online learning experience? Sure. I think that is a great question, precisely because people are much more likely to have access to a phone than to a, to a laptop. Um, I think. It really depends on, on what we're talking about. So it could be students might not be able to type out an assignment on a, on a smartphone, but they might be able to write it on a piece of paper, take a picture of it and upload it and then get graded on this, right? So I think that's where really the, the innovation is coming in is how can we mix the two? How can we use technology in a useful way and not just say, well, 
it's a smartphone, let's ban it from the classroom or the, the lecture theater. I think it always depends on how do we, when do we use it and how do we use it. Um, a colleague of mine at, the, at UCT, uh, Professor Nambi, is, um, has a, an edgy lab. So he calls it a sand pit for ideas where he gets teachers to experiment with different types of technology and then how to apply that in the classroom. And I think that is a really great way of, of going about it is giving lectures, lecturers and, and uh, high school teachers or primary school teachers the opportunity to engage with technology and to, to figure it out for themselves. The more familiar they are with it, the more they're able to come up with creative solutions that might only apply to their classroom. But that's really just what we need, right? So um, I think that, that is really the way to go is experimentation. Yeah, indeed. There's a lot of experimentation to be done. Oh, well, thank you very much for that presentation, Mr. Kronke. I would like to bring in Mrs. Moyo. Um, Shingarai, uh, very interesting and actually uh, relevant to our discussion today, technology and, and uh, electricity challenges in Africa. Uh, power went off in Zimbabwe and one of our presenters um, was affected by it. I don't know if she's ready now, but I'm going to check in with uh, Mrs. Moyo and see if she is ready to present. Yes, thank you so much. I'm using my mobile phone. I'll, I hope I'll be able to share my screen. Let me first of all try to share my screen first. If I'm not able to share my screen, I'll just present. Okay, sounds good. That's all then. Um, while she gets ready, I have one more question for you, uh, Mr. Kronke. How has it been conducting survey? What's the difference uh, that you've seen conducting survey post-COVID as opposed to doing that previous, uh, before the COVID pandemic? Yeah, so th this is actually has been a, a quite a challenge, especially for Afrobarometer, um, because we're doing it in different country contexts. So obviously some countries have high level spikes at different times and predicting that is near impossible. Um, so we actually had a, a break of about eight months where we didn't conduct any um, any any face-to-face -face surveys. And we only started again in October in some countries where we could see that it's a low level um, and we got the go-ahead from, from, from the local authorities. What we ended up doing as well is conduct, uh, collecting phone numbers from, from those uh, respondents to then start having follow-up surveys um, to see what are the differences. So, I mean, this goes more into methodology, but what are the differences in terms of how we interview people face-to-face -face versus um, via telephone? We also um, try to get phone numbers from for for countries but that is really difficult because unlike in some developed countries where landline is a lot more prominent still that was skipped in many african countries so we don't have a good register for that and with cell phones it's difficult to predict the location but also um, age gender and so on so it's it's challenging to do those sort of uh, telephone surveys across the continent. Um, but yeah, it's, as I mentioned earlier, that also is part of, of innovating is how do we, how do we adapt to that? And how do we still have meaningful surveys uh, done? Um, it's, it's a steep learning curve, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, no, definitely it is. Um, uh, Mr. Ching, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Moyo, uh, you can present and then we can receive the slides from you later. So we'll share the slides with everybody who's on this call today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm so sorry that uh, the, the electricity played up and, you know, uh, the connectivity just becomes very poor when the electricity is gone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, when I received the call on... Uh, navigating the educational divide. I just felt interested in sharing our experiences in Zimbabwe. I did a mini survey uh, using um, my mobile phone and uh, came up with uh, some insights on uh, the, uh, the digital divide in Zimbabwe. 
and how Zimbabwe has managed to mitigate that and also came up with the way forward. So I started by de defining uh, the term digital divide. I'm sure some of the colleagues who have just finished presenting have adequately defined it, but I used uh, to, to ask 2020 who define digital divide as an uneven access or distribution of information and communication technologies in societies. But moreover, a digital divide exists not just between those people with and without internet access. A divide also exists between those with digital literacy skills, the ability to produce content online, and the financial resources for optimal internet usage, and those without these. Uh, access to digital skills as well as afford affordable and quality internet coverage remains unevenly distributed in Zimbabwe. Right, I zeroed into the implications of COVID-19 on the digital debate access to education, uh, mainly focusing on Zimbabwe. Uh, I'm sure colleagues would agree with me that the lock lockdowns emphasize the digital divide in Africa, including Zimbabwe. Uh, mainly because uh, people were now confined in their homes. And when we look at the, at the education sector, the students were not able to move from their homes to their campuses or to their colleges or schools. And yes, that access to free Wi-Fi and data was not possible during the lockdowns. And access to ICT drastically decreased due to restricted movement of students, as I've said earlier on. And um, this was also exacerbated by the closure of ICT business, both for formal and informal sector. This, however, decreased access to ICT gadgets. And as a result, the lockdown just came uh, as a surprise. And most of the parents and students were not ready for this. And for them to be able to learn online, they needed the gadgets, but they couldn't access them because the formal and informal business sector were all closed. Uh, due to lockdowns also, there was reduced income streams to individuals and families, as you may all agree with me. Some lost their jobs. Some were not getting paid because uh, they were not producing anything. And for the informal sector, there was the most hard hit here in Zimbabwe because that's where they get their livelihoods. So, you know, the income streams, they were not able to buy data. They were not able to purchase even the gadgets. And, uh, you know, this just increased the digital divide. And um, however, having noticed that this, Zimbabwe was quite proactive. And uh, in June 2020, the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education, in partnership with UNESCO, relaunched a school radio program. We used to have this school radio program long back, but they relaunched it so that uh, students could have access to, to learning during the lockdown. And uh, schools, colleges, and universities you introduced online teaching and learning use, using law and high-tech tools. But with Zimbabwe, you have got Zimbabwe Open University. It, 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 has already started, it had already started running programs based on distance or remote learning since the turn of the millennium. So most of the universities then got some lessons from uh, Zimbabwe Open University, and some were now offering their uh, lessons online using WhatsApp and using email. Uh, telecoms companies uh, like Liquid started providing free internet access to institutions of higher learning and tertiary colleges. And they started this well before the pandemic as if they knew something bad was going to come. But however, as I earlier indicated, that the access was still a problem because students were not able to move to their institutions to access this free Wi-Fi. Uh, prior to COVID, uh, the president did the program to donate computers to several schools and community centers to increase access to technology at grassroots level. The country uh, actually had a um, big program on rural electrification to increase access to electricity so that the technology can be usable. And the solarization of schools and colleges to increase uh, access also for, for ICT. 
uh, having looked at all this, uh, we realized that there's a way forward uh, in, in efforts to reduce the digital divide, the gap between those who can access and those who cannot access the ICTs. Uh, the country is uh, moving towards using the multi-sectoral approach by engaging private and public sector in coming up with strategies to increase access to ICTs with special emphasis on the rural population and disadvantaged communities. Um, they are also working uh, flat out to increase infrastructure across the country by, uh, by having some innovation hubs at uh, technical institutions, universities, so that uh, students can also access. There is also a talk about the zero rate data for the education sector from lower grades to higher education so that the access to ICTs is in increased. And uh, there is greater need for capacity building on ICTs for both students and teachers. Because from this lockdown and uh, this lockdown, which was imposed by COVID, we realized that of course people can use their cell phones, they can take selfies, they can do what, what, what all sorts of things with their gadgets. But there is a gap in terms of how to use those gadgets for teaching and learning. And hence, it's, it's another area that uh, the country is looking at to say, let's come up with programs to empower the teachers and the students. And to this end, uh, already UNESCO and the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education are in the pro process of training teachers on how to offer online and open, open and distance learning through using WhatsApp. So something is happening. But of course, uh, this is the little that I thought probably I could share with the colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Moyo, for sharing um, your presentation under these uh, challenging circumstances. But um, yeah, it's uh, great to learn what's, uh, what you've been you know, experiencing in the education sector in Zimbabwe. I have one question for you, and then it's probably will be the same question for each of the presenters today. But before I get to my question, I want to remind everybody again, feel free to ask your question, feel free to unmute, to show your faces on camera. Uh, we're very free to ask questions to our presenters today. And my question is, uh, Mrs. Moyo, with regards to the future, how things are progressing. You mentioned there's a lot of trainings here and there from the government and also from, from nonprofit organizations, uh, UNESCO, and from institutions uh, themselves. So how do you see things moving forward in terms of um, uh, the way education um, will be offered? There's a lot of changes that have happened during this time. And um, do you see Zimbabwe moving towards like a blended? education in future or now that vaccines are, are being distributed, life is slowly going back to normal. Um, will we go back to in-class, in-person classes or digital learning will be the future? Well, uh, thank you very much for the question, Gloria. I think already Zimbabwe has moved to the blended approach to learning, teaching and learning, where students have some time online and uh, uh, sometimes they are just face to face. But of course, as you can see the situation, no one knows really when the COVID-19 is going to come to an end. And, you know, this experience is just given uh, us a, an eye opener to say, probably we need to be proactive in uh, doing things so that uh, our students at both levels, at all levels, they are not disadvantaged because of the pandemic. And as a country, they are in a high drive to make sure that uh, there's access, even if there's a, 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 a negative situation, there's access to teaching and learning. And uh, from what I've said earlier, already the government is uh, coming in to make sure that uh, the teachers are empowered, the students are empowered, and also to increase the access of ICTs so that in the future, there is a continuation of learning of, of uh, students and even at the lower grades during the pandemic. So as for Zimbabwe, as you know, we have uh, started vaccination. We are doing that in an incremental approach. And uh, as you could, could have heard from the news uh, from my country, is that uh, each and every institution is being uh, 
is being uh, the government is saying for them to open fully, you need to really observe the WHO protocols on COVID-19 to avoid reinfections. And probably during that time, it means uh, probably we are not going to be having full classes and the blended way of teaching and learning is the way to go. Thank you. Awesome. Dr. Singh, um, my next question is for you, is similar to what um, I just asked Mrs. Moyo. Your study showed a significant drop in blended learning. You know, prior to COVID, there were a couple of countries that were already moving towards blended, but that changed quite significantly during COVID. Do you see that, uh, that trend um, staying the same going forward? Um, actually, the very last question, the questionnaire for academics um, at the early stages of the pandemic asked what, what they saw the future shape of the institutions as being fully online, um, face-to-face or blended. And it would seem that most academics feel that the blended approach is probably going to be here to stay. Um, it's not likely that we're going to be fully online in the future for those institutions who will typically face-to-face because students still want that interaction, still want that contact. Um, Academics also, we also want that interaction with our students that we miss that personal interaction. So I think the, you know, the the middle line is probably going to be blended learning and it will help us to phase in face-to-face learning uh, in the future. I don't think there's going to be a direct switch from online to -to face-to-face immediately even with the vaccines in place. Oh, good to know that. I see Eva has a question. Yeah, thank you so much for the great presentation to all of you. My question is actually to the three of you. So in your presentation, you highlighted some of the challenges actually teachers and um, professors are facing in terms of trying to find a, a feasible way to teach online. And um, we know that in terms of infrastructure, um, difficulties or infrastructure challenges has been a big issue on the African continent. And also with the emergence of COVID-19, we've seen the inequality um, in terms of infrastructure and also the inequality all around our higher education institutions. So right now that schools have reopened, higher education institutions have reopened, my question is, what is the government doing to address some of this infrastructure problem that you have highlighted in your presentation? Because you made mention of um, um, this challenge but, um, that are facing students and actually in Matthias' um, presentation was talking about the fact that some people actually just have mobile phone and do not have internet access. So is there a way that government is working with your various institutions to ensure that the student and the teachers have access to even a common laptop? Let's say that they decide to build like a big room and put about 20 laptops there for students to use and, and it has like proper internet service. Is there anything like that um, there? Who wants to go first? I will, Mr. Kronke, please <laughs> take it. Sure. Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a politician thing and answer a different question. <laughs> Um, I think, so in the long term, there there are two two aspects to it, I think. In the long term, it's really about building that infrastructure. So access to electricity, uh, cell phone service, and building and and providing the the hardware, Um, and and just cheap access to to the internet. So zero rating, for example, I think might, um, might make a big difference. Um, but I think what, when we think about solving some of these problems, we need to also think about the um, institutional level. So in addition to, to the country level, it's really about the institutions. In Cape Town, for example, we have, uh, or in the broader Cape Town area, we've got three universities, which are vastly different in terms of resources. UCT, by far the, 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 the most resourced one can provide different solutions to, to the students. Um, and so the question is, you know, can we create institutional solutions to some of these problems? Can we set up 
uh, opportunities where some students from a different university can use the physical infrastructure that UCT provides, for example. So I think it's important to put on providing certain things, but in the short run, I think it requires a lot more creativity from other stakeholders as well, um, universities, lecturers, students, um, to really make sure that that we we leave no one behind, or at least as, as few as possible. Thank you very much. I don't know if any of the presenters, Mrs. Moyer, Dr. Singh, want to also add to the question that came from Eva. Um, sorry, I lost connectivity there for a, a brief period, so I put the last part of Matthias's uh, response. Um, yeah, perhaps just to add to that, I think, as he said, it, it requires also beyond just government intervention. So the concept, I think, of public-private partnership is also important. Um, you know, the, the, the private industry, they, they all have a role to play uh, in terms of the education sector, especially if we need to reach out to as many people as possible. So we've seen here in, in South Africa, for example, you know, the, the service providers uh, chipping in in terms of giving free data for students for educational purposes. But I think also looking at the student side, it's up to the students to play the game as well. So when the, you know, the free data was issued um, across many uh, students at, at, at varying institutions in South Africa, we had issues with students um, sharing those login details of, of that data and having five you know, concurrent connections at one time, sharing it with family members and using it for non-educational purposes. So it's the, the integrity is also up to the student because they need to, to find ways of purposes and don't just take it because it's free and use it for any other activities. So um, it's I think there's a, a, a lot more that we need to understand about the whole, whole scenario and it requires people to work together. As Matthias said, some institutions have very infrastructure and other institutions don't. So that also plays a very big role. Thank you, Dr. Singh. We have uh, three more, I see three hands raised, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to take all the questions. We're slowly coming to the end of our program, but I wanna give Mustafa a chance first. Mustafa, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, my question goes to uh, Dr. Moyo. Uh, she did a well, she actually presented well, but uh, my question is actually about, uh, it has taken, it's almost a year now uh, that we're in this situation of pandemic. Uh, what proactive measure is actually the government uh, taking to make sure that the citizens or in the educational sector, the teachers are able to have access to some of these applications that will facilitate educational uh, uh, delivery? Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, like I've indicated earlier on, the government in partnership uh, with the private sector and NGOs are coming up with um, programs to make sure the teachers are empowered and also there's increased access to teaching and learning in remote areas and even in urban areas. But of course, uh, it is not a one-day thing. It, uh, they will use an incremental approach where probably they start from somewhere and uh, gradually trying to cover everyone and making sure that there's access to teaching and learning uh, through online. And already, like I've indicated earlier, the government has taken a step further to offer um, radio lessons and TV lessons. They are being broadcasted at certain times. And even those uh, students who are in remote areas for lower grades, they're actually accessing because um, the access to radio, according to some uh, research that was done sometime last year, the access to radio is quite high in Zimbabwe, even in the rural areas. So there's a programming for radio lessons for different grades at different times. And at those times, the parents will tune in and they, the, the, the student will be listening in and participating in the activities that, will be, that they'll be doing. Uh, 
So all those are efforts in trying to make sure that there's access to education, even in a, a difficult situation. And of course, the uh, public-private uh, sector a partnership that uh, Dr. Singh has just indicated is something that also the government is working on. So something is being done. And we are just happy that uh, probably um, they, they just imagine if there was no technology, what would be happening? Everyone would have been closed out during COVID. But because of technology, though the penetration uh, percentages might be low, but at least something is happening on the ground. And from this, uh, different governments and countries are coming up with uh, strategies to make sure that there's access to teaching and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Moyo. So this is going to be our last question for today. Uh, that is a question from Peter, Peter Pinar. Hi, everyone. It's good to hear the presentations. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think it built on some of our conversations from the, the other day. My question had to do with moving uh, from descriptive data that we've seen today to more to providing some more explanatory explanations of some of the things that we see in the survey data. So I'm just curious to hear from the panelists, uh, particularly Matthias and Dr. Singh, who presented uh, sort of survey data here. What are some of the key research questions that you'll be exploring? exploring on more of the explanatory side than sort of identifying some of the descriptive gaps that you've uh, talked about today. Thank you, so do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks, Peter. So I think the one of the, <clears throat> the first questions that, that come to mind is really just looking into more detail uh, at what explains the levels of digital literacy so um and looking at the at the rate of change so with the new round of afrobarometer surveys we'll be able to capture how quickly these things change and we have this nice kind of natural experiment with the pre and post uh, pandemic so in which countries has literacy just jumped um and even within one round um, we have those that were surveyed immediately prior versus those that were uh, in the later stages of the pandemic. And we can see countries that are otherwise similar. Where, where have we seen some of these changes? So I think, I mean, this goes very much down the, the methodological route here. But that is definitely one aspect. Um, and the other one is just to, to see in which countries do we see the usage of what types of tools. So. Just looking at, for example, downloads of certain apps or platforms or usage data, um, and can we correlate that with digital literacy rates um, to see under what circumstances do we have platforms to be particularly successful or not? Um, so just to add, following that, uh, you know, the exploratory part of it is a little difficult uh, when dealing with such large numbers. Uh, firstly, as I may have said previously, academics and students are just suffering from survey fatigue. Uh, nobody wants to participate in research or give time for interviews because I think uh, prior to January last year, or on the pandemic or on online learning and the relation between the two. And suddenly between February and August, everybody was trying to get on the bandwagon and you know, get their, their research questionnaires out there first because there's no other research done in these areas. So the, the, for me, the way in which we can explore this is more giving people the opportunity to share their experiences uh, because when you do so via seminars, via sharing sessions and so on, you get to understand how people navigated this move to online, what were some of the challenges they faced, and what are some of the unique ways and creative ways in which they adopted these tools. So, um, you know, right now we're editing a book. I'm one of four editors who's editing a book um, by uh, Elsevier, and, and we're looking there specifically at academic voices. So we're trying to bring out what it is that academics felt in this journey 
And then last year in December, we inaugurated the first digital conference, and that was focus was on digital teaching, learning, and assessment. And although the conference was conceptualized prior to COVID, it was conceptualized in January 2020, um, it created a platform for international academics to share their experiences on this journey. And our theme for the second edition of the conference is the journey beyond. So we're hoping through collaborations like these, through platforms like these, we're able to understand better and explore better what's happening on a broad scale. Matthias uh, referred a lot to Mauritius, and we had quite a few presenters from Mauritius, and we could see how, although Mauritius is part of Africa, but how much better they were able to cope with this transition to the online environment compared to many of our African countries, even us in South Africa, for whatever reasons they might be, a smaller population, Union Island, and so on. But there were many lessons to be learned from the way in which they handled the higher education transition from face-to-face -to, -face to the online environment. So for me, the easiest way for us to explain these webinars, sessions, um, getting people in their own discipline to get together and have this sharing of experiences, because right now trying to get formal research might take you a long time to get responses. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Singh. And I would like to thank everybody who joined us today. And I know there's a lot of interest in this topic of education, disruption, and COVID, but I would like to tell everybody here today that we have more programs on these specific topics. We have two more programs coming up in this month of March where we will continue this discussion. And uh, so for today, I would like to thank you for joining us and we hope that you will come back again in two weeks for our next Hangout, which is uh, on March 16, uh, which will continue, as I said, we'll continue on the theme of higher education, COVID-19 disruptions and innovations. I would like to specifically thank our presenters today, Mrs. Shingarai Moyo, uh, Mr. Matthias Kronke, and Dr. Apasana Singh. In the meantime, I will invite you to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and also uh, join our Discord community. If you don't know how to do that, visit our website, leadersofafrica.org. And then you can also find out how you can join our Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Again, thank you very much for being with us today. Will you